It's a great pleasure to welcome John to the, the Writers' Festival. John was born in Hamburg in 1962. He had an international upbringing and uh, went to, studied at Cambridge, became a journalist, and is now a writer across the fields of fiction and non-fiction. Four novels, The Debt to Pleasure, Mr. Phillips, Fragrant Harbour and Capital, and works of non-fiction. The one preceding How to Speak Money, Whoops, Why Everyone Owes Everyone and No One Can Pay, a book about the global financial crisis. And of course, we'll be talking about things not unrelated to that today. He's won numerous prizes, the Whitbread First Novel Prize, the E.M. Forster Award, and he's listed for the Booker Prize. It's a great pleasure to welcome, please join me in welcoming John Lancaster. Thank you. Thank you. John, I wonder if we might start with you clarifying some definitions that underpin some of the more esoteric topics that we're going to talk about today in financial jargon. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to read, uh, just to give you a flavour of the book, uh, a short passage about um, the difference between bullshit and nonsense. <laughs> um, though actually, in fact, um, you get a very good uh, example of bullshit that comes in very useful at festivals like this and I employ myself quite a lot uh, which is when you see someone you like half remember or half recognize across the room you say loved your last one <laughs> <laughs> bullshit and nonsense are different bullshit is all around us the term implies exaggeration rhetoric and a mild kind of untoxic falsity it implies that something is false, but not malign. Every time somebody tries to sell somebody something, a degree of bullshit is usually involved. Some words are more or less guaranteed to be bullshit. Executive, for instance, <laughs> is, when used as an adjective, pure bullshit. Executive chef, executive apartments, executive decision. Exclusive is bullshit, not least because it's mostly used about places that are open to the public, like restaurants and hotels. But the damage done by bullshit is usually fairly mild, and it can even be, if not exactly benign, then so much part of the normal process of selling that it's just part of the dance. There's a big issue seller near where I live who holds out a copy with the line, last one. <laughs> when he sells it, he waits for the customer to walk away, then reaches into his bag and pulls out another. Last one. That is bullshit and relatively harmless. I say relatively rather than wholly harmless because once you've fallen for the line and then seen through it, it tends to diminish your trust in big issue sellers. <laughs> My children saw him do it and I think they'll never give to a big issue seller as long as they live. The hype cycle around new inventions involves a near ritualized early period of puffing, boosterism, and bullshit. As John Perry Barlow, songwriter for The Grateful Dead, once brilliantly put it, bullshit is the grease for the skids on which we ride into the future. <laughs> um, I like that line because it's both an example of bullshit and a great explanation of it. <laughs> There is an enormous amount of bullshit in the world of money. Nonsense is different. It's worse. It consists of things which are actively false and, at its worst, of things which are not just not true but can't possibly be true. It's rarer than bullshit but much more toxic. And it's the difference between someone exaggerating a bit because they're trying to sell you something, and someone who is consciously lying to you, or who is so far out of touch with reality that they don't know they're lying. <laughs> Thank you. John, so much of the terminology in finance can be confused with either bullshit or nonsense. What, what makes it so complex, and what led you into the topics of seeking to clarify what these issues are? Well, I think 
you know, in defense of the language of money, it's often complicated because the things in it are complicated. Um, the, the example I always use is of the thing that came up during the credit crunch of super, thin, super synthetic CDSs made of, synthet, made of synthetic CDSs made of CDOs based on RMBS. Which, you know, is if you don't under, I mean, it, it's totally baffling and excluding and bamboozling if you don't know what those things are. But actually, all those things are real things and they're quite complicated things. And if you know what a super synthetic CDS is, it's actually, it takes about 10 minutes to explain that, you know, it's a credit default swap made out of mm. other credit default swaps which don't actually own the underlying thing that they're made out of. Which I know it sounds like something out of Harry Potter, but, but trust me, that's what it is. And, you know, the, the language is compressed because the things are often very, very complicated. And then added to that, you do sometimes have an element of deliberate obfuscation and bamboozlement and confusing the customer. And, and the net effect is you have this gigantic gap. I mean, the reason I wrote the book is I got very preoccupied by just this gap between people who, who just speak money, who understand language, understand the language of money and the rest of us and, and came to the view that actually it was very damaging for society, very damaging even for democracy. It makes the kind of texture of our democracy thinner if we, we literally don't know what people in the world of economics and finance are talking about. You know, it, our, the little mark we make in the ballot box is just that bit more random than it should be if we don't really understand this stuff. Do you have to be a mathematician to understand those um, credit well, default swaps and the like? I think, you know, it's funny actually, someone asked me that this thing, you know, what's more important in understanding the language of money, English or maths? Which is a good question. Um, no, you don't have to be a mathematician. I think that, um, you, you know, that the, the, the kind of abiding rule I have about this stuff is that the underlying, the, the, these things are often really properly complicated, things like those CDSs and CDOs. Those are complex things, you can't fake that. Uh, and, and the things that they're based on are mathematical. Um, and you know, the maths is, is crazy complicated. Some of these um, derivative instruments that exist, they have things called black box derivative instruments where both the person buying it and the person selling it don't know what's in it. it it's a series of mathematical equations and formulae designed, you know, it has a, a, an amount of yield it's supposed to give in, in terms of interest rates it has a number to how risky it is, and that's all anyone buying and selling it knows. And inside that, you have things that are up to a billion lines of computer code. And as there's a guy at the Bank of England called Andy Haldane who works on stability there, and the point he makes is it's impossible for any person to understand that. I mean, it's, it's not a joke to say it is literally beyond human understanding. So I think the question is, in a way, that makes the mass less important and it increases the importance of understanding the, the principles. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, the way, the approach I have is that, yeah, the underlying, you know, the stuff that the, we're talking about can be at a level of mathematical complexity, almost impossible to get your head around, but the principles aren't. The principles of what we want from finance and what we need from finance and how society should work with finance, those principles are, are simple. And it's a bit like the, um, the, uh, Dr. Spock books about childcare and having babies. You know, the, the kind of central rule in Dr. Spock is trust yourself. You know more than you think you do. And I think something similar applies in the world of economics. Often after an economic failure, the old line, if something sounds too good to be true, then it probably isn't true, comes out. Yeah, and my dad, and my dad, in fact, who worked for a bank, uh, worked for the, um, the reason I grew up in Hong Kong, he worked for the then sleepy colonial institution, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, uh, which is now global mega, unloved global mega bank, HSBC. Uh, and, but um, my dad used to say, he's very fond of quoting this thing that all you need to be a genius in investment is a short memory and a rising market. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Some of these topics, like derivatives and collateralised debt obligations can perhaps be left to the experts. Some of them affect all of us, not uh, directly ultimately. Quantitative easing is affecting 
every developed economy in the globe. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure about the leaving the derivative to the experts, actually. I think that one of the things we need for banking is for it to do the really simple basic things of taking our deposits when we have excess cash and lending us money when we have needs. And I think that the way in which that, you know, that really is pretty straightforward, what society needs from, from banking. And the way that these institutions have got mixed up with very, very complicated things. Like, and the derivative stuff is essentially gambling. It's, you know, participant A betting against participant B. There's a winner and a loser. Um, and, you know, in theory, the social benefit is the winner pays the tax. Uh, but A, a lot of the time they don't. And B, um, the, other, the other party has lost money, so the other party's writing it off against tax. So the net social benefit is zero, whereas the costs are very high when things go wrong, as we saw during the credit crunch, and you know, we're still living through the aftermath. So I, I'm not so sure about leaving the experts to, um, to it. I would, I would separate the industry out much more. I would have a safe, regulated banking sector that work effectively like the utilities business, where investors know how much money they're going to make and risks are quite low. And then the other stuff I'd tell them, you know, piss off and run a hedge fund. And in, in, a, good, in a good year, crash your Ferrari into the swimming pool and good luck with it. And in a bad year, bye-bye, sorry, and don't let the doorknob hit you in the backside on the way out. And, and, you know, when they blow up, they lose their own money and it doesn't cost us a cent. That, that's what I would do with that kind of super complex instrument. I think on the, uh, on the other point, like quantitative easing, I do think it's a, a massive thing, and I think it's a very important piece of, it's not exactly, well, I wonder if it's deliberate obfuscation. It's certainly, um, it's a sus suspicious piece of language, quantitative easing, because I always think it basically sounds like a, a brand of laxative. <laughs> <laughs> As in, you know, what do you think about quantitative easing? Oh, I don't know, my nan said just stick to a bowl of prunes first thing in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and actually what it is, is it's this radical new technique for printing money, governments to print money like it's going out of fashion, without admitting that that's what they're doing. Mm. Um, and I think if electorates were told, hey, we're doing this crazy new kind of printing money without admitting it, are you cool with that? Uh, I think we might say, um, not so sure. And it's had all yeah. sorts of effects on you know, the money, the banks don't actually lend the money, surprise. Uh, and it goes into assets, so you get things like stock prices and houses rocketing in price, and yet the credit is still jammed up. Mm. And it's a, you know, a wild experiment that a large part of the developed world is engaged on, and no one knows how it's going to play out because it's never been tried before. It's always sounded to me like something that's going to gently get better. But in fact, the, the uh, more informed opinions now, I think, are that at some stage there will be a great reckoning well, and, and, uh, and no one in charge seems yeah. to know what the reckoning will involve. Yeah, and you know, uh, the image I use when I'm talking about in the book, um, you can probably tell I'm half Irish, but it's like a, a peat fire. And peat fires are very dangerous because they build up underground. And you know, it's possible that QE is having some effect like that, that there's all these kind of distortions happening to basically what things cost, what things should be worth, that will that will suddenly erupt. But, but the truth is, and, and the kind of scary and alarming truth that keeps coming back in this subject is that nobody knows. And you know, Will, William Goldman, the screenwriter, wrote a fantastically good book uh, called Adventures in the Screen Trade. It's the best thing ever written about the way Hollywood works. And he sums up the whole of everything to do with a lifetime in Hollywood uh, in the three words. He said, nobody knows anything. Um, <laughs> And, you know, OK, that's fine for Hollywood, but it's a bit alarming that it applies to the entire world of economics and finance. Mm. Should we be able to just expect that our political leaders and decision makers actually do understand those, those issues? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that we've gone a long way out on a particular limb pretty much everywhere in the world in terms of deregulation and mm. a, a kind of the same neoliberal model that's being applied everywhere. And I'm not sure that that was sold to electorates in a truthful way um, about the kind of consequent things like the rise in inequality that in, has ensued mm. with deregulation. And, you know, it's a really weird thing that um, it's been much studied that taking away rules on the international flow of capital, I've now forgotten the number, but... Um, it's in, the flow of capital in cross borders has increased by factors of thousands in the last decade. Mm. 
I can remember when Mrs. Thatcher was elected in 1979. I remember because we lived in Hong Kong. And when you went to Britain, it was a gigantic pain in the bum was the fact that you could only take 500 pounds out at a time, 500 quid sterling. And, you know, and it's strange to remember that's only 30-odd years ago. And now you have total, totally free movement of capital. And it's been much studied by academics trying to look for a benefit, trying to actually look for the benefit on the global financial system and to individual citizens. And no one's actually found it. The totally free flow of capital on an unprecedented scale across borders, as far as we can tell, doesn't actually bring ordinary people any benefits. And again, that's a thing I'm not sure our leaders have really explained to us, that we have you know, one particular variant on, of many different possible variants mm. of a, a capitalist system. And you know, it's not clear that it's, it's working to serve at the ordinary citizen's purpose. Well, regardless of other matters of her politics, Mrs. Thatcher was probably the last political leader who took global finance back to the analogy of running a shop and explained that if the outgoings exceeded the incomings, then you were going to be in trouble. No one has entertained that concept since that I'm aware of. In yeah, but it's also uh, about two thirds wrong uh, because, you know, <laughs> economies are, are not, are not they're, households. They're much more complex. You know, go governments can print money, governments can create jobs. Governments can run, you know, sustained deficits over long periods, and and it's actually um, a misleading and in some ways potentially quite dangerous metaphor. And one of the things that's happening in the eurozone at the moment is uh, Chancellor Merkel is selling that to the Germans. You know that we mm. have to keep a balance, but you have to what they call the black zero, which is a fantastically sinister sounding way of saying that you know there, there's no deficit, their earnings and their spending are in balance, but. She hasn't explained to the electorate that you know, the Eurozone is a more or less closed system. It trades mainly with itself. If Germany's running a surplus, someone's running a deficit. And you know, sometimes you look at the, pol the German policy, looks like they're saying, well, everyone should run a surplus. And that is like saying two plus two should not equal four. It is just not possible. If you're in credit, someone else is in debit. That's, that's a, a law of mass. And the kind of household metaphor is very, very dangerous because it's it's immediately graspable and seductive and in really, really crucial, dangerous ways, it's wrong. But somewhere in the correction of that, things have, uh, perhaps the pendulum's gone a little far into neo-Keynesianism for, for long periods of time. I don't and, think that actually. I mean, certainly, uh, and it doesn't look like that in Europe now, um, where the problem is, you know, aging, aging population, slowing economy, and you know a real risk of prices falling over time, and then we really w are, you know, it's, uh, Europe isn't. You know, it feels like a comfortable, stable place in one respect, but you know we're we're also slightly peering over the edge of the abyss. Uh, in in and you see it in the rise of quite dangerous populist policies, and and I think one of the things that um, might change attitudes in in Germany, certainly around. Mrs. Merkel, is that if the penny gradually drops, it's dropping pretty bloody slowly, but if it actually finally drops to realising that one of the consequences would be the National Front winning the elections, which are coming in 2017. And that would be a hell of a punchline to be, you know, so fiscally sensible, so cautious, so moderate, so pragmatic that you end up electing fascists in the country next door. I mean, that's quite a historical punchline. And I think one of the reasons you might see a change in, uh, in European policy is just that everyone's terrified by the thought of, um, you know, I mean, Marine, the, the National Front really are a, a party of the extreme right. And they are, you know, not at very long odds to win in 2017 because all the parties of the centre are saying, you know, the euro will work, the euro will work, the euro will work. And the National Front are saying, actually, no, it won't. Inequality is, is where the real issues express themselves. As, as a, if you look at, across Europe, for example, um, the, the unemployment rates that we hear of are extraordinary. There's been a, a lot of study of inequality, and I guess London is uh, your, your home base is a, 
a great example of uh, widening wealth lifestyles. Can you talk a bit about what what the forces are that that's driving? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I mean my interest in, the, in the, every everything I've written about this comes out of a novel I, I wrote. I, w I wanted to write a novel about London, uh, which is called Capital, and it came out in 2012. And I started um, just really, you know, the thing about, <laughs> the thing about writing a novel, there's a, there was a wonderful old drunk called Geoffrey Bernard, some people here might remember, who had a column in The Spectator um, about being an old drunk um, called Low Life. And he reported once this conversation that he claimed to have overheard at the bar of the Coach and Horses where he, where he, he more or less lived. He was the first man, first man to second man, first man, I'm writing a novel. Second man, neither am I. <laughs> And, you know, writing a novel is a lot like that. I have to sort of mulling over what to do next. And then suddenly realised that the subject was literally out my window. You know, it's just literally the things you see in the street outside your house. And, and so that's the thing that started me thinking about this whole area, because one of the things you see in London is an extraordinary pressure of, of change. It's just kind of completely convulsively changed. When I, when I was growing up in Hong Kong, and, you know, the first times I went to London, it seemed so boring and so so like so gray you know the sky was gray the buildings were gray the people were gray the food was gray uh, the food was like a whole category of grayness in itself and and you know you couldn't possibly think that now it's unmistakably a place of immense energy diversity color vibrancy um, and dramatically better food of several different colors <laughs> and and you know i was thinking what well, and I think, actually, you know, this place has changed so much. It's a kind of change of the order you get after a, a revolution or a war. You know, it's fundamentally, convulsively changed in the last 25 years or so. And that's what got me interested in this subject. And finance is one of the drivers of that. And one of the massive, massive things that's happened is this thing about it being so much less equal. And it's actually um, one of the reasons that my novel Capital has a, is structured like a 19th century novel is... It, you know, the thought that hit me was actually London's in a kind of 19th century condition. Uh, and one of the big things in that is just this gigantic and growing gap between the people at the top and the people at the bottom. Uh, and also, you know, to, to give the kind of world of money its due, it's also a kind of shining place that people dream of going to. Um, I was once, um, I got locked out of my house one day because my wife forgot that she had my keys. And so I had a whole afternoon sitting in the pub, which, which I, you know, when I was in my 20s, used to happen a lot and doesn't much now. And, um, so, and I got chatting to someone there who's a, a Polish woman showing her mum around London, uh, slightly raising the question of why they were sitting in the pub all afternoon. Anyway, um, and she had a PhD in child psychology but was working as a cleaner slash nanny. Um, and she was talking about her reasons for being in London and kind of gave various kind of practical ones and then her expression slightly changed. And it had this slight far away look. And she said, and of course, you know, there's also the London dream. And I was very struck by that, because that you know, we used to talk about the American dream. And America is the idea that you could transform your fortunes, you know, remake your life, become, have some amazing other version of your life by going there. And London's become a kind of magnet for people living that dream. And one of the side effects and drivers of it is this gigantic inequality. Um, and that's what started me thinking about it. And, and in fact, you know, it, it, I don't think there's ever been a time where you, the main political topic of conversation was the same everywhere in the world. But if we were you know, in Rio de Janeiro, um, Edinburgh, New York, Beijing, even somewhere completely godforsaken like Sydney, you know, inequality is the number one topic. And that's, that's really, that's a strange place we've got to globally. Mm. Thomas Piketty's book on capital came out last year, shedding a lot of insights into this and uh, uh, kind of went off the radar screen for various reasons. What, what should we have learnt from that and... Uh, why, why do you think it got uh, diminished so rapidly? Well, I think, I think the thing about Piketty is that even if he's wrong, he's right. 
in that, you know, even if, um, the, you know, roomfuls of pointy heads working around the clock 24 hours have find, found things in the data they don't agree with, um, there are the broad things he's describing we can all feel are true. You know, the, the gradual ascendancy of capital over labour, that's something we're, we're living through in our lives right now. We can, we can see it, it's evident. Um, I think that, you know, and I think that's why it had this, this global success. Um, I was saying to, um, saying to a, a dry senior economist friend, that, you know, but it was, you know, but Pikeki did incredibly well everywhere. Um, it was a top 10 bestseller in all over the English-speaking world. It, it's, it's amazing that it, it wasn't a bestseller in France. And he's, he's I said, no, it's, I think you'll find it was, the thing that was amazing was that it was a bestseller anywhere else. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's a, but, uh, it, you know, it, the reason it did, did so well is it did capture this moment and capture this thing everyone feel. And I know there's been a kind of backlash with people complaining that the data are fiddled about with and tweaked and all that, but two things I'd say. Firstly, people who are cheating on their data don't publish spreadsheet, spreadsheets online which anyone can look up, which is what Piketty did. You know, that, and secondly, that because he's using historical data on accumulation of capital and stuff like that, and you can't use that in untreated form. You, know, you, have, to make, you have to make sure you're comparing like with like, and that's very difficult to do with historical data because that kind of data, um, you know, historical economic data, it's a bit like potatoes, you have to cook it. Uh, and you know, his data is slightly cooked, but it's only to make it, make it function. Mm -hmm. And I think that book is gonna stay part of the conversation for a long time because it's, you know, it just is this thing, as I say, we can, just, we can all feel it. Who else is articulating the problem? And if they aren't, wh why is that? I think that one of the funny things about the, the GFC and the, and the Great Recession has been the absence of a kind of coherent, articulate response from the left. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, and I don't quite know why that happened. I think partly that, you know, after the end of the Cold War, the left retreated inside the academy. I think that was part of it. I think partly that there were that there was a sense that somehow one version of capitalism had won and that the kind of developed coherent responses weren't really there. Um, I think, uh, you know, an odd, a, a scary thing, whoops. A scary thing, obviously, apart from that moment of demonic possession, <laughs> is that, um, is that um, there's a very good guy called Martin Wolf, who's a commentator in the Financial Times. He does the macroeconomic commentary. And he's really hardcore. Um, you know, he's the sort of person that central bankers quote and talk to and, and respect. And um, he's, he's written a book called The Shifts and the Shocks. And it has a whole set of prescriptions about um, how to fix finance, how to make it work for the ordinary citizen, you know, what to do. And the stuff in it is crazily radical. It's like changing the way that banks can keep relending the same money, which sounds like a nerdy thing. It's called fractional reserve banking. But changing that is like massively sort of Che Guevara radical. And, and Martin Wolf is so much not that person. Um, you know, he wears a kind of nine-piece suit. And, and, <laughs> he, and he kind of invented Davos. And he has breakfast, lunch, and dinner with central bankers every day. And, um, and then there's various other things about, you know, restricting the thing I was talking about, the movement of capital across borders, which in that kind of central bank world is, is like, um, it's like saying, actually, no, the earth is flat. You know, I mean, it's so out there. And he's such an insider. And I was saying to him, you know, on a, on a panel, actually, I said, that, but, you know, these are crazy radical ideas, Martin, as you know perfectly well, none of this is going to happen unless there's another crash. And, or crisis, and he said, yeah, I know, I'm writing a series of policy prescriptions for after the crash. And I, I must have, I, whoa, you know, that's really mm. an alarming and disconcerting thing. And, um, and another man, a man called John Kay, who's a very, very brilliant um, economist and commentator, also in the Financial Times, and he's writing a book about how the finance, what the financial industry would be like if it was serving society, if you kind of got rid of the whole thing and started from scratch. 
And, you know, A, it's bizarre and disturbing that that's a funny idea, you know, that, again, you know, you're in flat mm. earth territory. And I said to him, but John, you know, you, you, you are talking about a, an amazing counterfactual there. It's, you know, um, like, it's like a wildly radical alternative. And he said, yeah, I know, I'm writing a set of prescriptions for after the next crash. Mm. And so I, I, I fear and suspect that what, what we're going to ha happen is all the stuff that we ought to have done globally, systemically, in 2009, you know, we're going to do after the next time things blow up, linked to the euro, linked to the China, or linked to whatever unforeseen thing it is. That, you know, that there's, there's, a, there's a saying that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Mm. But we did waste the last one, so we're going to have to do it next time. Nouriel Roubini, I think, is, uh, he was probably one of the few who was pointing to the last one and uh, doesn't seem to think that the issues have gone away. Right? No, well, the issues haven't gone away. And in a weird way, um, you know, again, the thing that people just feel in themselves is true, I think. Is that, and a lot of people feel it's, it's still 2008. You know, that, that's a very strong feeling in Britain and mm. the United States and Europe. I don't know if it's as true here, that people just mm. feel that we're like flies trapped in amber. And that moment, ha we haven't really moved on from that. And, you know, the thing is that the, the systemic and structural things, they're all still the way they were. You know, and the, some of the problems, you know, too big to fail are worse. Um, you know, there's a curious sense of, um, you know, we're, we're stuck there. And actually, funnily enough, I'm not pessimistic because it just means, you know, okay, we didn't fix it last time, we'll have to fix it next time. There is that dichotomy, certainly, in Australia. There's uh, um, particularly the political level, the desire to be seeing everything coming back to some sort of normal and any trend in that direction, suggesting that that will take us back to that state. Whereas if you yeah. talk uh, uh, privately to bankers and fund managers and so on, they see quite, uh, quite a rocky road. Yeah. Uh I agree, and you know the people who know a lot more than I do about it all, all say that. I mean, it, well, it's an odd thing, though. It's a weird thing we have in our societies that um, actually this is a point that John Kay made to me. I've, I've been thinking about it ever since. That actually politicians have no incentive for avoiding these crises. Um, and he was quoting the thing in Joseph Conrad's novel Typhoon that the captain just stay, sails straight through the middle of the typhoon. And they, you know, they all think they're going to die, and then they eventually get there. And, um, and the narrator then goes to him after they, they're arriving, says, why did you do that? I mean, why did you sail right through the middle? And uh, the captain just says, because if I'd gone round, I would have been two days late. <laughs> and it's a really profound and interesting thing, that, because, you know, and all he would have got was told off for being late. He wouldn't have got any credit for the thing he'd avoided. And I think the thing about politicians is that the way the system is set up, they don't get credit for avoiding these crises. There's actually very few downsides to a politician for living through an obvious external shock. An external systemic financial shock doesn't, you know, there's no benefit for them for kind of seeing it off from happening in advance. And that's a really strange quirk about democratic politics. We are better able to tap some of this information, the writers that you mentioned, through the internet. And we're seeing, that, and a lot of the products that uh, we've talked about are products of, of big data and, and uh, information technology. It's early days for those technologies. Are they going to help us understand these issues better, or are they going to deliver, in your view, more complex problems? I think it may be. I mean, the, the shorthand thing that a lot of uh, economists f phrase that use are that, quote, robots are going to eat the jobs. Uh, and I think it's possible that, that, you know, some of these things coming are, are going to have a very disruptive effect just in the kind of the texture of ordinary, um, ordinary life. You know, um, I was, uh, a very good writer who's at this festival is Tom, Tom Rackman, uh, whose books I, I recommend, his novels I recommend. Tom used to work for AP, um, the Associated Press. And I was looking at a thing just the other day 
a, a piece written by AP uh, that was written by a robot. I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's not. I mean, that, I know that's a joke that's been around for a long time. That some, it sounds like it was written by a, a robot or a computer, um, or by E.L. James. Uh, and but, but this was actually literally written by an algorithm that just takes the raw data coming out in the financial report and turns it into sentences. And I think that kind of disruption, and you see it in I've see, and things like specialist legal software, which I've seen up close, close at hand, that does a far better job of scanning and parsing documents and looking for patterns mm. in the data than a roomful of researchers you know, working overtime mm. for months because you can scan millions of documents in short order and the software d does all the detecting of patterns. So I think that the kind of the big data and the impact of information technology is probably going to lead further down the direction of, you know, capital winning out ahead over labour. I mean, just as a thought experiment, imagine Google's driverless car, bang, arrives tomorrow, um, which it won't, by the way, because it can't overtake, for one thing. And, and it, can't, um, it can't merge with traffic. Um, and, the, you know, they, they, it's driven a, a million, million plus miles around Palo Alto, where Google is based, um, uh, and has only had two accidents, both of which, once when it was rammed from behind and once when the human driver crashed it. Um, but, you know, Palo Alto is very grid-like, so it's a long way away from actual... But a thought experiment, it lands tomorrow. And the main effect of that would be huge amounts of jobs just vanishing. Every job involving driving in the whole world would have gone overnight. And anyone whose job is like half or two thirds driving and the other stuff, things they're paid for, like loading and unloading, filling out paperwork, inventory, blah, blah, blah. The half involving driving is just, the value of that has just gone to zero. And obviously employers aren't gonna pay the same for the other half they're paying for the whole job. And all of that money would be going to Google instead of to all those mm. other agents and human drivers. So I think, you know, and obviously that's not going to happen, but just as a sort of way of thinking about that trend, um, I think that it's, it's possibly one that will just reinforce, you know, th that thing that often happens, that the future is very like the present, only more so. We have, uh, in Western Australia, an interesting example close to that technology where... Uh, the 300 tonne trucks that go around our mines, which are some of the biggest mines in the world, in the case of two groups of those, are driven by a bunch of computers on one floor of each of two buildings Blimey. in Perth. Wow, didn't they, know that. They, they're doing the trucks, the trucks are good. Uh, they're not yet on to the loaders, but watch this space. It's really interesting. And, and the trains, the technology is all there for the trains, but there's a lot of other issues there. Well, and when you, when you see, you know, footage of things like that, which I haven't, I will look at that, it's really interesting, but there, there's things like Amazon have uh, robots made by a company called Kiva, they bought Kiva, um, and so some of their warehouses, though they're not called that, they're called fulfilment centres. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good, isn't it? Mm. Um, uh, in, so in the fulfilment centres where they put the things in packages and send them off. I mean, there are humans there, but most of the work is done by robots. And you look at the footage, of the, and they move very slowly, inexorably, always on right angles, and they pick up this whole... They can carry 700 pounds. They can lift 700 pounds of shelves and once and move them along. And one of the things you think looking at it is that work will never be done by humans again. That labour has just gone. And mm. I think, it, as I say, the, when you think about what that implies in terms of the balance between what our labour is worth and the power going to capital, capital, I think we are kind of moving in the direction of, of Piketty world. Mm. It's a good time to go to questions. Can we get the lights so that we can see and the microphones? Uh, and I think we have a question over here to start. I was wondering, is there ever going to come a time when in the language of economics they really do bring the language of economics into the real world, the, the real world that we live in, the biological world we live in, where there are absolute limitations. There are things like natural services that come from clean air, clean water, and all those things. And there is things like the precautionary principle that we don't understand how these very large and complex systems all work together. 
And uh, I've been reading quite a lot about uh, the coming famine and the food crisis we're facing and where you have um, food being speculated on on the stock exchange, which caused the last major food crisis in 2008 when they were speculating on, on the major grains. It wasn't necessarily the failure of the crops, but it was the speculation that drove underneath the, the great food shortages that caused problems in, in Asia and in, in Latin America and other places, and probably drove a lot of the problems that there are in um, the Middle East at the moment. So is there ever going to be a time when we can bring these two languages together so that you have a real understanding of what we have, what resources we have, and what we need to do? I hope so. I mean, I think that one of the, one of the things, that, one of the wrong turns in economics really is to do with not treating it as a toolkit, you know, that it has this sort of intellectual ambition to, towards building perfect models. And as a field doesn't spend enough time looking at precise ways in which it can actually help, because economics can be very helpful at studying patterns of, patterns of behavior and patterns of things that happen in the world. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a weirdly deep impulse in the field to sort of turn the back on the world and turn towards largely mathematical models. I was at, just before coming out, I was at a talk at the London School of Economics, and this bloke was, um, most of it was over my head. It was all about trade and stuff. Um, and it was about trade between countries, and he built this model. And someone, and insurance, that's right, about trade and insurance and risk. Which, and so it's all about things that actually happen, trade and insurance between. And, someone's, and questions come. I was clinging to life by a thread, I have to admit, by the time we got to questions. Uh, sticks up his hand and asks about, you know, country trade, some specific thing. And um, the guy said, um, oh, well, that's interesting, um, but that's, um, that's a, a real-world implementation, and uh, I haven't actually built the model to analyse that. <laughs> Which is like saying, hey, world. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I do think that's, um, I, you know, I think that economics would have all sorts of useful things to say about. Uh, and there are people who study resource scarcity and things like that. But, but, you know, there is this odd... To an outsider, which is totally what I am in the field, um, it, it's strange the imp how deep the impasse goes to a kind of preference towards modelling to, as opposed to, you know, study of the real. Okay, question here. Two, two quick observations and a question that connects with it. I mean, your, your point about the robots, we both know exactly the same could have been said about threshing machines or any other technological advance. So I just wanted to put it to you that it was, we're at a moment in time, and I broadly agree with you that it's an unusual one, but it's not a completely unique one. The second one is that um, your point about Amazon, probably a significant number of the people in this room are members of superannuation funds that probably own Amazon. And we have never been at a time in human history when so many, mem so many, when so many members of what used to be fashionably called the proletariat are participants in the capital system. Two, two trillion dollars in this country alone, let alone the US system and others, and there's lots of changes which I'm sure you're very well aware of as to how that's developing. And Some of the questions that I think you've posed this, this afternoon are more intergenerational necessarily than intercapital and labor, but I'll see if you want to pick that up later. The question is this. I've read your stuff and a lot of other people's, and I, I think there's been a profusion of great literature um, after the crash, and I agree with you, most of it's not been a particularly well-informed leftist view, but I think there has been good stuff, and you, you didn't mention Kotlikoff and other people who've put, and Schiller's book on, on finance and the good society. But the one thing that all of them seem to miss is that none of this could have happened were it not for the greatest single collapse in interest rates we've ever seen from 16% in 1979 to now US bond yields where they are. And that the point about the Greece metaphor is even better perhaps than you thought, that absent that, and it is now absent that, because we can't have that collapse again, that actually the thing is much more self-correcting than perhaps I think even Martin Wolf might suggest. So I just wanted to ask you about where you thought the interest rate reduction played a part in the dramas, the 30-year interest rate reduction in the dramas of the last few years. Oh yeah, no question. And the um, uh, and it's obviously, you know, with things like QE, you have interest rates effectively going down to zero and then, you know, into negative territory. And I think it's a huge part of the story and it's part of the, the quest for making up crazy, risky new devices. It's just to sort of 
desperate hunt for yield um, to replace the, the interest rates that we used to have. I mean, on the, on the other points, um, I'd certainly have mentioned Kolokoff if I'd, if I'd read him. Um, but um, on, the, on the thing about the, the threshing machine, I mean, yeah, the data is very, you know, uh, 1810 US agriculture is 90% of the workforce, 2010 is 2%. Um, and, you know, there wasn't a cataclysmic unemployment, there were hiccups, but, you know, basically those, the labor, labor went elsewhere. The thing about the robots is the speed, the speed with which it could happen. And the, the, the paper, um, is, uh, Carl Benedict and Frey, they're called two economists who studied it, and um, they put the, f the percentage of jobs at risk in the next two decades as 47% of the U.S. economy. Mm. Now, the thing is, we could manage that fine, over a century or so. We've done it plenty of times before. We've done it, broadly speaking, with every technology that ever came in. And Keynes talks about once about technological unemployment and how it's never really happened. People invent a thing and the jobs go poof. Um, but the, the thing that I think is different about the robots and that plays into this thing about capital and labor, uh, which is also intergenerational, um, is, is the speed. You know, that's the thing. That, the new, new thing, I think, is the speed with which it could happen. Yes. Um, two possibly slightly banal questions from, from an absolute lay person like myself. Um, first one, what do you see as the take home message from the Wolf of Wall Street? And secondly, and I'm, I'm not sure how well you, 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 you know the Australian situation, but um, uh, do you, I mean, there are people who are talking about a, a massive real estate bubble in Australia being fueled by lack of reg regulation of foreign investment and speculation in the local domestic market is would there be a case for better regulation of that um, speculation in the real estate market I d i'm afraid i don't know enough about the, the detail of that um, i don't know where the where the capital is coming from because you do have controls don't you on foreign capital coming into don't you have to buy new but okay yeah, he's making it so so just i'm afraid i don't know enough about um that to, to comment on the um, on the Wolf of Wall Street, um, I thought I went through an odd thing about that film. I started wanting it to be something other than it was, and suddenly realised it's a comedy. <laughs> and, and and in fact, I really like it. I've seen it a couple of times, but it is purely a comedy. Um, uh, and he's very interested in the kind of comedy of excess, and that's that's what that movie, I think, is mainly about. And in terms of the lessons for the world of finance from it, the main one, which is actually the most important one in terms of how that, I mean, he's a very small player, Jordan Belfort, but in terms of how that world works, that movie is completely about the single most important thing, which is don't get caught. I mean, that's, that's where he went wrong. I, I know you're not an Australian, but I wonder if you could comment with your knowledge of economics and finance and politics, whether you could comment on the strange fact that Australia, since Federation 1900, has had roughly twice as many years of Conservative government than it has had a Labor government. It's roughly 80 years to 40 years, and yet there are a lot of things in Australia people tell me are unfair and need to be addressed, the sort of things that perhaps one might think uh, Labor would do, but Labor is not in power anywhere near as long as, or hasn't been in power anywhere near as long as the Conservatives. I Could you comment on that? Sorry, I didn't know that, actually. I didn't know that the, the imbalance was quite so profound as that. The, the odd thing is that it's the same in the UK. Um, and the Conservative Party were in power for more of the 20th century in, in the UK than the communists were in Russia in, in the 20th century. Um, in part, you know, so um, I don't know. I mean, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a strange thing in Australia where there is quite a strong, you know, um, egalitarian and democratic instinct. So I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, the one thing I would say um, about the current situation is that uh, I'm actually a massive Tony Abbott fan. Um, not as a politician, because he's a like a major national embarrassment. You all know that, right? Yeah. Just, yeah, just, I just, just wanted to check. Um, I mean, like worse than Iggy Azalea. I mean, that, that bad. Um, but I'm a, a massive fan of him as a boxer. 
Because um, when, when I was a student at Oxford in 1982, a friend completely at random said, do you want to go and see the varsity match? Which is Oxford v Cambridge, and it's like the big thing in all the sports. I was at Oxford, by the way. That was a vicious slur at the start, not Cambridge. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and um, so I, I'd, I'd never been to a boxing match in my life and went to this thing. And it was in the Oxford Town Hall, and it was unexpectedly really great. Um, very exciting. All the fights decided on points, no knockouts. And it was four all, and it came down to the last fight. And the Cambridge bloke came out, and he was like, um, he was like a, what an SS recruitment poster would have looked like if the Nazis had won the war. <laughs> like he was seven foot six, and blonde, and chiselled, you know, um, looked like he was made out of marble. And then the Oxford bloke came out, and he was this sort of short, hairy, dark-haired Australian. And, and, it, the, and the only thing I remember was he introduced something, something, and, and, the, and the Royal Australian Navy. And he was very obviously going to, going to lose badly, because the other guy had a reach that was sort of three feet longer. And he was sort of, and the Cambridge bloke was like this. Sort of stretching, <laughs> and, and the other guy, and he snapped like this. And I thought, oh shit, we're going to lose. We're going to lose 5-4 in the last fight. So they came out, touch gloves. And as I say, all these fights were won on points, you know, kind of, because they're all actually students, you know, just doing this, this. And then the heavyweight fight, and the ref rings the bell, and the Oxford, the, the hairy Australian boat, just literally sprinted across the ring, and he went bang, down like that. <laughs> and there must have been about 800 people who were all to their feet. It was absolutely amazing. Also, in a, in a weird way, very, very funny. And that was Tony Abbott. <laughs> so, as a prime minister, he's, let's face it, an unqualified disaster, but he's got a hell of a right cross. Maybe he should have delivered on his threat to Mr. Putin. <laughs> and, and I'm told he uses boxing metaphors, and they're not metaphors. Uh, there and then here. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, in the uh, borrowing and lending chain that we use through the banks, who's at the end of it? Is it the World Bank? That's one question. And secondly, why don't we uh, lend our superannuation money to Treasury rather than to banks? Well, you, I mean, because you, you get such lousy yield is the answer to the second one. Um, I mean, the, you've got this astonishing thing uh, in, in Europe. The, 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 um, the, the yields on those things are, are negative. You, you know, you pay much. If you want to give the German government money for 10 years, you, you, you pay them for the privilege. They don't pay you. Uh, raising, raising the then very obvious question, why aren't they you know, building more infrastructure? Because German infrastructure is in a terrible state. Um, no, the weird thing about money, you know, the modern world of money, is that there actually there is no agency ultimately behind it. There's something very strange about the fact that governments are effectively, since the end of the gold standard and the Bretton Woods Agreement in the, in the 70s, which was the thing that kept global currencies fixed to each other and ultimately underlyingly to, to gold and to the gold reserves. That's why that movie, um, you know, Goldfinger is about stealing all the gold in Fort Knox because that actually did underpin the global financial system. Um, and now nothing does, nothing real, except our confidence that, you know, that the $5 note in my pocket is actually worth, worth $5. And that's one of the things that's so strange about the modern nature of money is that, is that it's effectively... Um, it's effectively sort of fictional. You know, that it's a willed... The thing that gives it value is our will to believe that it does have value. Um, and there is something, you know, just from the point of view of someone who writes novels and makes things up, there's something really interesting and strange and almost, it's almost vertiginous about, about money as, our, as basically our, our most important fiction. Um, and it's one of the things that's so odd about quantitative easing, because that's a g government's effectively... It's like if you log, look on, log onto your bank account and look up the balance, and you could just type a bit more in, you know, like lob on a couple of extra noughts. That's effectively what quantitative easing is. And it makes, you know, it just makes that point about the kind of arbitrary, almost um, virtual nature of the thing that dominates everyone's life. You know, it's so strange, it's so, it's so 
fragile and tenuous and willed, and yet it's the most important single force in most people's lives. Two quick questions, one here and one down the front, and I'm, we'll have to wrap up then, I'm afraid. Uh, you've spoken a bit about robots taking all our jobs, but it seems that no one's really safe because one of the uh, things the robots are doing now is trading, and whether it be uh, just broad algorithmic trading or high frequency trading or low latency trading. Um, how do you think this will play out? Is this better, leaving the computers in charge? No, it really isn't. And it's very, very disconcerting that so much of what we, you know, so much of the market isn't, you know, we think of a market as people trading against each other. And it's not. It's algorithms betting against each other in uh, air-conditioned rooms with no human agency involved and no grown-up supervision. I mean, people know there was a thing called this flash crash in 2010, which, which is now quite widely known thanks to the wonderful book by Michael Lewis about high-frequency trading. But there was a more recent thing. There was a thing in October last year um, with US government debt, which is the most widely traded market in the world. I think something like $10 trillion a day. It's a, it's a gigantic market. And it's very, very liquid. There are people, every tiny price movement, there are people on either side of the price. So you know, it just, it, it hardly moves at all because there are buyers and sellers everywhere. And then in a few seconds in October, um, the, the yield on US Treasury debt, I can't remember which way around it went, but it went, I think it went from 1.7 to, to 2.16 in, in a fraction of a second. And that might not sound like a big deal, but that's an event that the mathematical models they use, that's a, a seven sigma event that's supposed to happen only once every, I think it's three, three billion years. Which, in other words, the maths tells you that that means it's impossible, and yet it happened. So the Fed, the US Federal Reserve, had a big conference of all the market participants and traders and academics who study it. They had a huge conference in December over a three-day weekend to try and work out you know, what had happened. And the con conference's conclusion was that they didn't know. <laughs> That's scary and weird. The most publicly available, biggest market in the world, and literally nobody understands what's happening in it because it's not humans. It's Last question. Thank you. We're told that Australia escaped the worst of the GFC because our banks were very well regulated. Can individual countries protect themselves against these forces? Or to use technical jargon, is that bullshit or nonsense? <laughs> no, I think governments can do a lot better job on that. And you, you see it in, um, in Canada, which had much, which like Australia, I think for similar historic reasons, had. It had lots of bank failures in the, for, in the early years of the last century, and as a result, had very tight regulations. So um, since, the, um, since the, the first, uh, um, since the Great Depression, uh, and you see the contrast very clearly, Canada severely regulated banks that function quite well in terms of lending money. America, very unregulated banks. America had 32,000 bank failures since the Great Depression. Canada's had two. So the takeaway has to be that you can effectively regulate banks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we may not like all the things that are coming, but I think out of today we have uh, a great deal more insight about at least what to look for as they come towards us. Please join me in thanking John very much for today. Thank you. Thank you.